Hey everyone, our young organizer Afia is leading this space and I just, I'm just gonna check in to make sure that she can transition well into the breakout room. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. My name is Afia Black with Foster, and I'm the, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the New York City Youth Organizer with Soul Sisters Leadership Collective. Um, our mission is to mobilize system-involved girls and non-binary youth of color, Black, Brown, and Indigenous, to build power and disrupt all forms of violence, economic exploitation, and oppression. And we do this with our four pillars, which are leadership, radical artistic expression, healing, and social justice. And the question that we're here to answer today is, um, how do we use radical art artistry in our you know, programs? Um, Soul uses radical artistry to advance narratives like through our many programs like Heart and Soul, which is rooted in emotional justice, and focused on healing, transformative justice, education, and peer leadership. And we also have another program called Fashion for Social Change, which creates a space for young women, femmes, and non-gender conforming youth to learn about social issues, identify a message, and design a product that raises awareness. Um, am I allowed to share my screen? Let us know if, you, if it doesn't allow you, but you should be able to. Okay. Um, this is also a zine that we created recently um, for an event that we tabled that called Building Black bed Style. This is just like an excerpt of, you know, like a section of the zine that we created. Um, we just created a space for youth to gather and, you know, express themselves through art. You know, being that there's a big change with, you know, COVID and then, you know, the new mandate in New York City. So, you know, we wanted them to be able to tell us how they were feeling and also give back with, you know, goodie bags and also do outreach. And if you can see, you see our social medias, our website, everything is Soul Sisters Leadership Leads Soul Sisters, if you want to see more. If you have any questions. Do folks have questions? When do you, when and how do you use the zines, Afia? So, um, well, a zine is basically like your own magazine. It's like, it's kind of like a scrapbook. You know, like we just put a whole bunch of things together and this it could particularly could be used for like, you know, back to, anytime really, it's art. So, but we use this for back to school because, you know, there was a lot of check-ins and a lot of things that you do. This is just some, you know, we had uh, food pages, hairstyle pages, nail pages, you know, everything for back to school. Um, there was like mazes, it's amazing. And then I saw your like promotional video for your five year anniversary. And I saw this clip where the girls were singing, like really powerful. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that song that yeah, we're singing, if you if you know the video that I'm talking about, and then how you all use song in your work as well. Um, I do know the video you're talking about, but I'm not sure what song particular because we do have programming in Miami as well, and I'm based in New York City. That's probably what it was. Yeah. Um, but we do use song in a lot of our programming. We do have teaching artists and things of that sort. And I would just add chant as well. Of oh, yes. I almost, I was going to say that we always chant. I, you know, I go to chants, that's not a chant. You know, um, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to, you know, if you know that chant, we yeah. say that 
every every for everything after every event it's our duty to win right uh yeah. we must love each other and support each other we have nothing to lose but our chains nothing to lose but our chains and we need those reminders on a regular basis yeah. this is awesome afia and i'm really hyped about the entrepreneurial element of your of soul's work too because y'all are supporting young women to do their own sales and business too so we're like super excited that you shared your work and just shout it out everybody snaps for Afia. all the love mm-hmm. to soul sisters and we'll see you in the main good morning. thank you so much for attending my workshop my name is fabiana and um, i am joining you from ohlone territory also known as Oakland, California. And let me just see who's in the room. Oh, Isabel, hi, great to see you. Hi, everyone, I'm just, I'm just seeing if I recognize folks. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Just going through the list here. Um, well, I'm super excited to uh, share some strategies with you today. Um, what I'm gonna do is uh, share some slides and talk about the role of culture and art, and then we could open it up for questions. So we have until, um, I'm in PST time, we have until 11.30, so I'm gonna try to zoom through this as fast as possible. All right, let me do a share screen. Okay, and then, um, if folks can give me a thumbs up if you see a screen that says culture and narrative change great okay y'all so we're going to be talking about the power of culture and art and why it is a key oh no i think she dropped all right hi everybody this is vanessa i want to give you an opportunity to go to room one, to switch to room one, if you want to hear Fabiana, because there was a little confusion. The main room was like the room one, and then room one was actually room two, Fabiana's room, and room three is Vanessa, my room. Um, So please make the switch. No, not not like all good um, coming in or out. And I will just kind of dive in. It's wonderful to be here with you all. I feel like I could just be in circle talking to everybody, um, but I was asked to present. So let me go ahead and start sharing my slides. Maybe I'll give it one second here. Um, First of all, I'm Vanessa. I'm coming in from, calling in from uh, Chichenyu land here, Ohlone land in Oakland, California. It's again, wonderful to be here with everybody from across the country. And I just feel the spirit in the room. Um, I know we're gonna do some good thinking today. So um, I'll move through my slides. Um, And I cannot see anybody, can't see the chat, so I will just try to move so I can get back to you all. So um, here, today we're going to talk about the role of culture and arts in movement building and social change. And um, the questions I was asked to answer is, are, um, what is the role of culture and arts in movement building and social change? And what is the unique role of a small funder, Akinati, in a targeted geographic area of Oakland? So we fund only in Oakland. We've been here for 21 years. I wanted to start with this definition, cultural sovereignty. And this definition um, is borrowed from Melanie Benjamin, who's the chief executive of the Millie Lacks Band of the Ojibwe people here in, 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 on, uh, in, the, in the, what we know as the US. Cultural sovereignty is our inherent right to use our values, traditions, and spirituality to protect our future. So to me, this is just a really good anchor to think about why culture and cultural sovereignty, honoring who we are as, um, as people from, from within our culture is so important within uh, a really a racist and oppressive society, how coming back to culture actually offers us a space of power um, and belonging. So really quickly, the Akhenati Foundation is a racial justice foundation um, based in Oakland. Our values include racial justice, communities of color and leadership, intersectionality, a term borrowed from black feminist scholar Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, um, leadership from from the field, from from the people um, and cultural expression. 
Um, quickly, what we do is we have an all in for Oakland in, uh, initiative, which is a closed fund, but it was very directed on our um, youth justice and um, education justice work happening here in Oakland, California. We do have an open fund called So Love Can Win. This will reopen in 2022. There are $10,000 um, general operating grants to groups that have real roots here in Oakland um, doing cultural work. Um, voice or, or journalism um, concerning communities of color and, and power building, um, organizing and uh, healing. Um, and we also do partnership work. So we get together with other foundations to try to like raise more money for our folks. And there's the California Black Freedom Fund that, that was launched just last year and Belonging in Oakland Fund, which is actually funded partly by CERDNA or primarily by CERDNA. Um, and we do that with the city of Oakland uh, and, uh, and, and East Bay Community Foundation. So I just wanted to lift up um, Akhenati's approach, uh, our value to, to thinking about culture. And what we state is that culture is an essential component of power building through culturally affirming spaces and narratives, people and movements build their strength and come to understand their relationship to each other and to the generations that preceded and will follow them. Um, I want to talk to you really quickly about the, the, some research that we have um, conducted around, around culture um, that is concerned about um, counteracting structural racism, right? So the, um, this was a couple of years ago now, and uh, I think it was 2018, um, that we did this mapping small arts and culture organizations of color in Oakland. What we wanted to do is make visible all of the rich cultural work happening in Oakland, because what we were hearing from our fellow funders was like, we don't really know these folks of color. Like, where are they? What do they do? And we're like, oh my God, there's so many. And like, you know, we could be a mic for them, but like, let's, this is where we felt like research was important to say, here are, here are our people, here are all the wonderful things that they're doing to really keep the, the, the spirit and the, um, just like cultural, um, sustenance alive in Oakland. And what are the practices really of, um, of really a culture of movement building and power building in Oakland. So I invite you to take a look at that report. Again, these are o Oakland organizations and we did this in partnership with the local foundation and, and a group of researchers listed here. Next, this is a project that we launched actually this year. It was a, it was kind of, it was a research project essentially to profile artists in Oakland um, and we called it creative space so that creatives in place. So we wanted to create something beautiful that really showed the plethora of artists that are like both from like Samoan, Fafa Finge, which is the third gender dancer to, um, to NK Oruche with the Afro Urban Society, who is, you know, a, a Nigerian woman really um, coalescing a community of both um, Africans from the continent and then, Af and then black people here in the US and creating those bridges to, to create a dynamic place of like belonging and culture and art here. So this was a really wonderful project. And what we asked them is just to speak from speak about their needs and what they were visioning for our futures. And um, it was a really beautiful project and something that we felt like we could amplify. These are our folks. These are our folks that are really lighting the, the torch for what, 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 what we need and what we want in our communities. And I wanted to just give you a sense of Oakland. I think Oakland has a reputation that kind of precedes itself, right? Um, we have uh, the Segorate Land Trust. We have the indigenous folks of, of this land. The Black Panther Party was born here in Oakland. There's a mural honoring um, the uh, Malonga Cascalord and other um, other local artists um, who who have contributed greatly to really Black pride, um, indigenous pride. Um, and it's like it's we we would never like assume that that brand that that brand is like or that concept is shared across the world really right and Oakland um, but doing organizing within Oakland this is this is these are the these are some of the folks that add to that kind of vision right of like what we want to see how we want to belong that counters really ra racist I ideas of who we are and, and really offers us a place of belonging. I, I also included ball culture here, which is of course like um, a very, you know, foundational thing in New York. And, and we also have, a, have had a ball culture here in Oakland as well. And so the idea is like, what offers us a space to, to belong here in Oakland? What are ways that we, we seek to affirm ourselves and, and take space and, and have expression in a way um, that celebrates our, our cultures and identities? 
What I wanted to do here is um, give you a sense of what our local grant partners are doing um, to engage culture as a way to affect narrative, narrative shift and counter structural racism, affect policy change, and really starting at the root with, with, um, with why we belong here as, as people of color, right? So first we have the Black Organizing Project, who is um, one of your uh, one of the folks that are part of this cohort of, of, of people. And of course, many of you probably heard that last year they were able to dismantle the Oakland Police Department, Oakland Schools Police Department, which was a huge win. And part of like the question that they anchored in, and they, they talk a lot about, and you can speak to them directly, but about how culture was at the core of, of, um, of saying, you know, this is who we are as Black people. This is how we want to love and come together, whether it's through spirit, ceremony, food, um, and through that kind of like building and community building emerge their black sanctuary pledge right so the idea that school should be a place community should should be a place a black sanctuary where um people where where, where grandmas and students young people um and parents can all find a place to belong and what does that mean in practice um and how do they actually challenge folks who are not black to say how are we all creating a space for black sanctuary, for belonging of, of people of color. And so um, in many ways, I would, you know, Oakland, I mean, BOP is thought of as an organizing group, which they very much are. And, 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 and I think we've come to know that they are actually a cultural group as well, right? That's, that's asserting a space for, uh, asserting a space for, for black people and black pride and belonging. Um, here we have 67 Sueños, which is a, a youth organizing group, primarily working with undocumented Latinx um, students, but not exclusively. So it's it's both like Muslim and, and, and Black youth here in Oakland. And, and this is a beautiful mural that they created, which is a campaign that says no human being is illegal. Um, everyone has a dream, right? And so there's an idea of like, uh, you know, our undocumented brothers and sisters often have to hide. And what does it look like? Or, you know, the, what does it look like to create a, a place of not only belonging, but like power for folks to really assert that um, the, their, their needs as people living here in the States. Um, lastly, I wanted to just share with you this wonderful project called The Black Woman is God. Karen um, Senefru's, um, she's a local artist here from Oakland, and she just created this, this, this space that was just epic and really resonated real worldwide. And it's about ceremony and art making, um, centering Black women, um, and, and really expanding this space of like when you come to Oakland, there is a sense that this is a place of, of, of black pride and belonging and beauty. And um, you know, we today we're just meditating on like why these cultural spaces really give us the, the bridge to the fight, right? The bridge to when we have to assert our, our needs um, within, within racist systems, right? So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we've learned and I'll move quickly. So we're almost wrapping up here, but um, this is kind of what's been referred to as like the power flower, right? So then with organizing at the middle, we have research, communications and narrative shift, alliance building, leadership development, org development, advocacy and, and, and policy. And what we're asserting is that actually culture, art and healing kind of is the sun that kind of um, allows each of the petals and the flower and of course the center to bloom. And part of what we're saying is that how, do, how, do, how does culture and healing really um, show up in these different spaces. So I just have a few examples here in organization and organizational and leadership development. It really looks like staff wellness, right? What do staff need to be to be staff and organizers need to sustain themselves in, in really in really challenging work at times, right? So culturally and culturally relevant or indigenous um, healing practices, ceremony, um, and also time away to experience like joy and like get get us back to where we are earlier I thought to ask you guys all like what brings you joy and oftentimes what it is that comes up is is music and food and gathering and so um you know so I'll move on to the other one of the other pedals but it's communication right and we've heard a lot today about storytelling and creative production narrative narrative shift that amplifies the visions of our movements and really paints the pictures of where we want to be and belong and of course within alliance and coalition building we look at we look to culture to like be the visioning space right and be the connector be the like the concerts and the and, and the things that motivate us and to have um, shared cultural and celebration and also to kind of like interrogate 
harder things like appropriating people's culture or campaigns, right? And creating some, some um, ideas on how we should best navigate some of those, those, those harder spots, right? So um, just quickly, I, there's a few kind of, well, quite a bit actually, <laughs> um, bullet points about why culture is central to racial justice, organizing, power building and movement building. But one is again, to repeat that culture affirms and celebrates through music, visual art, food, prayer, ceremony, um, it builds a sense of belonging, brings people together and, and nurtures bonds, um, creates practices that help people heal. Um, and it's, you know, cultural affirmation, loving who we are, where we come from, our histories, um, or, you know, having critique of our histories too, counters the criminalization, can counter the criminalization of people of color. Culture offers um, a place for restoration, right? For us to continue on this work. Um, and um, culture and narrative should, again, counteract racist ideas and allows our movements to build new narratives that shift power ultimately. And um, so this is like for funders, right? Because I think funders are, are learning on, uh, on a learning curve, I would say, or maybe let's just say learning, they are headed towards this affirm it, um, funding culture, right? Because oftentimes it's like, you know, what's the transaction? What's the policy you want all this kind of thing? But why is culture important too, right? So how can we speak about like why culture is central to, to this work? Um, and so um, a lot of what we've seen and what we've noticed is that it, it allows organizers to engage their base um, through cult concerts, events, food, storytelling. It re reinvigorates staff again and organizers, provides opportunity for healing, release, provides affirmation, joy, remembering, and is a way for us to vision. And again, we've heard more about building new narratives and, and then also thinking of, of culture as a strategy to, to make our movement strong, right? How might we... Um, you know, engage it as a strategy. Thank you so much for today and much love to you all and all the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you, Vanessa. I wanna thank you on behalf of AFF and the organizers for a wonderful presentation um, and, and just for sharing, sharing with us and, and giving us that funder perspective about how culture is, it is really moving movement. Um, so just wanna lift you and appreciate you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I wasn't making time for Q&A or anything, right? It was just like present and then breakout rooms. Yeah, and if anyone has questions, you can drop them in the chat. We're also collecting questions for folks to respond to later as part of our follow-up. So if at any point you have any questions um, as a presenter or as an audience member, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We are collecting them um, for responses. Thank you so much. Oh, and there are three that occurred to me, or maybe there are really four. I don't know. I'm just going to say them. And I'd love to know if they strike you as also um, narrative threads that are interesting and important right now. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is organizing in general. I started doing this work in the late 80s, mid to late 80s. And trust me, if you said, I'm leaving college to become an organizer. Nobody was like, oh, what campaigns are you going to be doing? <laughs> they, they would ask you about your closet or, you know, some other kind of organizer, which I wasn't. So this is definitely over the last 35 years, there has been a absolute shift in the um, in Americans understanding of and interest in and actual joining of activist um, events, active activities, actions, um, sometimes through organizations, sometimes not. The form is not 
um, always the same as it has been in past decades, but definitely tons of organizing. And I think in particular, labor organizing is at such a height right now, involves so many young people. Uh, so I think, um, especially people in their 20s and, uh, and in their late teens. So I, I think stories of Definitely these big national stories of strikes, but I think locally and regionally, there are also lots of uh, stories to dig up and focus on that advance the themes of uh, collective power, people who do the work get the rewards, um, those kinds of ideas of merit. So labor organizing is one kind. I think um, mutual aid organizing, which isn't, when I was starting as an organizer, I wasn't taught that mutual aid is a thing that organizers do, but since the pandemic, it clearly is a thing that organizers do now, and historically, it's a thing that organizers did in um, all immigrant communities, communities of color, poor communities, working communities. People um, did their social action while they tried to take care of each other. That's a very, very solid relationship in our lineage and our history. But over the over the second half of the 20th century, as social work became professionalized and organizing also became professionalized, that the, those two functions got split off from each other and separated. And I think uh, the story of mutual aid coming back into the organizing mix and uh, lots and lots of people engaging in that kind of activity is very resonant. And the last thing I'll say here is um, we often talk about how as activists, as movement people, as organizations, we need to advance a vision. We need to tell people this is what we imagine the world and our community and our country looking like if we succeed and if we get together. And that vision is very, very important. But what I've learned over the last period is that if we talk about our vision without acknowledging the obstacles and roadblocks to getting there and without actually narrating to those roadblocks, then people aren't going to believe us. They're going to be like, oh, that's just some like Pollyanna crap over there. Or that person is just naive thinking we could have a world without capitalism. What? Like, no, we couldn't. Um, so I, I've been thinking a lot about why our vision doesn't take root because it's good for most people in the country. And I think it's because we try in our narration to go too quickly from here's all the horrible stuff we're dealing with right now. I'm trying hard not to cuss on this webinar. Um, and here's our vision. And people are like, what is in between those two things? Because I can't see it. Um, so it's our job to, to help them see, help them acknowledge the obstacles so people don't feel like, oh, that's only in my head or there's something wrong with me that I see that. Why can't I be an inspiring social movement leader? Because I'm a cynic and I see all the things that could go wrong and all the ways we could fall down. And all the attacks on us, um, those are real. And if we try to ignore them in our storytelling about what makes movements work, then um, people know that those are real and they think we are then fake and they wouldn't be totally wrong. Um, so, so those are th three things I'll say, organizing, um, uh, two kinds of that in particular, labor and mutual aid, and then vision roadblocks what we do as a path, a story path that might get us more people going in the direction we actually want to go in. So that's my, that's my quick spiel on resonant current uh, narratives and stories, and I'd love to hear what you think, what resonates with you, what you've been paying attention to, or um, what you think about those, those top lines that I put out. 
Thank you, Rinku. Does anyone have any questions or? I have a question, but I want to make space for other folks. So I'll 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 pause. And then if no one jumps in, I'll jump in. I think you're on. Um, thank you for that. Rinku, can you share more about, I think often mutual aid tends to be dismissed um, as not like viable, sustainable organizing, or it's kind of like, you know, I, I, I feel like my sense is that it's it, people downplay the importance of mutual aid. It's like long history in community um, and it's viability. Can you share more about just narrative around validating, if you will? And maybe validating is not the right word because I feel like that's also rooted in like white supremacy, but can you share more about, um, I don't, I don't have a better word, but validating the importance of mutual aid um, and its long history and in terms of uh, sustainability and community. Yeah, um, I was trying to find it quickly, but I, I uh, wrote an article last year in 2020 for Zocalo Public Square about, um, about this history of mutual aid. And really it's so remarkable. I learned so many things uh, doing the research on that piece. And what I mainly learned is that, I mean, the history of public uh, programs that cover the things that mutual aid used to cover is much shorter than the history of actual mutual aid. So in this country, the way through most of our history that people have gotten by has not been through government programs. Um, it has been through relying on each other. Um, and, and, and in fact, it's those models of community reliance that formed the foundations for our public programs. So for example, Frances Perkins um, was one of the women who worked with uh, Jane Addams to start the Settlement House program. Settlement houses still exist, um, immigrant communities all over the country use them. Um, and Frances Perkins learned about the needs that workers and unemployed and disabled people had, women in particular, and um, took all of those ideas over to the Works Progress Administration where she was um, you know, one, of the, one of the leaders. And um, so in fact, arguably mutual aid is the, sustain, is the more sustainable model. And if people don't have that experience of helping each other out and, and being helped, in community and daily life, they're, I think they're less likely to trust government institutions providing those say, you know, some of those same uh, helps. So mutual aid, the importance of it is that it breaks down the value of individualism and it counters that value with, with communal collective um, we're here for each other and in it together um, ideas. So yeah, I, I would argue that I would push hard and say that that's that, you know, and reclaim that history. And if I can find this article, which I should be able to do faster, I will drop it into the chat. And there's a lot of great um, stories in there too. Rinko. And if you don't find it right now, no worries. We'll send a follow-up email to everybody. I wanted to turn to Daryl. I see you have your hand up, Daryl. And, and hi, Rinko. Thank you for this and, and all your work. Narrative Initiative and, and, and Race for Before. Um, I've, I've been thinking about the narratives around labor um, and particularly around kind of like the middle class narratives that are emerging in terms of like work is changing and you can work from anywhere. And you know, and then the, even the jokes we make about Zoom calls. And uh, I think the, the tension, I'll speak really clearly is, then all of a sudden there's a John Deere strike and it's like, the, and it's like labor is now ready to pop and it's like the everyday man. So there's kind of this tension around labor that's emerging, the narratives around labor are really interesting. And, and so I just wanted to name that. 
Yeah, and I do think it goes both ways too. At the same time, this notion of a labor shortage and supply chain issues and blaming that on pandemic policies rather than on, um, you know, the large death toll that we had in this country or on, um, you know, people not going back to work because there's no childcare. Like, mm -hmm. it's not about the unemployment benefits. It's about like, Right. There isn't any childcare, so <laughs> yeah. So these are these were always in tension. That's what makes this work so fun and engaging, and and Sí. Yo me moví para el... Sí, lo dejé ahí mismo, pero me fui para el dos. No, tradujo... Eh, ¿No? Ah, ok. El aprovechatismo. No, 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 aprovechatismo. Se quedó así como... Sí. Uh, uh. Welcome, Alisa. Se veía la imagen, ¿verdad? Yo, no, yo dejé de ver todo. Ah, ok. I'm going to put you on mute when we talk, okay? Hi, Alicia. Um, hey. Welcome. Welcome. We're so grateful to have you. And I know we have a limited amount of time together. So I'm just going to kick it to you for you to jump right in. And folks, if you have any questions during Alicia's presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat as we'll be doing follow up. Um, thank you. You have the mic. Awesome. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, my name is Alicia. I use she, her, hers, and diva pronouns, and I'm based in Oakland, California, uh, which is also Ohlone land. Um, I want to talk really quickly about narrative change, podcasting, and building Black political power. And I want to start off by saying that the way that I understand narrative change is really a part of building political power. And by that, I think I have to start off just saying how I understand what power is and what it isn't. So many of us think about power as empowerment, which is really, empowerment is like about self-esteem. It's about feeling good about your current existing circumstances, right? Um, and feeling good about your role in it. But power is about changing the rules and making the rules. And when we talk about what it takes to build power, uh, there's several different kind of forms of power that we need to build at any given time. Um, one of those forms of power is the power to tell the story, narrative power. And the way that I see that is very much about um, who gets to shape the story and tell the story of who we are and who we can be together. And I spend a lot of time um, studying how it is that people use narratives to build power. For example, um, right now we are in the middle of a culture war. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard um, about efforts, right? For example, to keep trans people from being able to access um, basic safety and health and dignity needs. Um, but the way that you probably hear about them are um, in ways that are about things like um, bathroom bills, right? Or sports, right? But there really actually is an underlying agenda there. And part of what that underlying agenda is, um, is to create chaos and tension around the role that gender plays in our society. Who belongs and who doesn't belong? Who gets to be seen as human and deserving and who doesn't? And so when you hear all of these things, right? And you might be asking yourself, well, why are they focusing on trans people, right? It's because it's a part of this larger narrative around gender and gender equity that is really at the foundation of the founding of this nation, right? Um, where certain people are supposed to play certain roles. With um, building narrative power, I think it's also really important for us to be thinking about not just how we counter the stories that are out there about us and about our communities, our value, our worthiness, but also what are the stories that we're telling to each other about each other? And how does that either inspire us to fight 
um, or to build something new um, or to change our minds about the ways that we've been taught to think about who we are, what our value is and what we deserve. Um, and I always use the example of um, the stories we tell about social change, particularly the stories that we tell around the last period of civil rights. Everybody has heard about bus boycotts, right? And dogs and hoses, freedom rides, right? Crossing um, bridges and being beaten, right? Um, but very few people have heard the actual correct stories about um, those incidences. And they haven't heard a ton of stories about the, the long history of movement that led to that particular point. That's why when we talk about Rosa Parks, we say that she was a seamstress who um, was tired of being on her feet all day and she just didn't feel like moving to the back of the bus. Actually, Rosa Parks was a trained organizer. She did a ton of work with the NAACP around voter registration. She fought back against segregation. She actually also at that time um, was a strong activist who was working to prevent sexual assault and sexual violence in her communities. She had been an organizer for a long time and actually um, her case, right, was used to help kick off um, this 350 something days um, of bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. When we hear about people like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, right, we hear stories that actually place them on pedestals and shape them as superheroes. And they did a lot of really important and powerful work. That's not the issue. The issue is that when we tell those kinds of stories, um, we communicate to each other that it's really difficult for normal everyday people to make change, that you somehow have to be dropped from the sky and imbued with these magical qualities, right, in order to make change. And it's the reason that a lot of people don't join movements. It's a lot, it's a reason that a lot of people don't take up leadership. So let me talk a little bit about my podcast, how we're building political power and how this intersects with policy change. I mean, we talked a little bit about anti-trans bills, right? Um, and the gender war that is happening in this country. And you can see the, the, the very clear intersection there. Um, but what I've tried to do with my podcast called Lady Don't Take No um, is invite people into learning about politics and the issues and rules that are shaping our lives every day without also making people want to slit their wrists. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but honestly, during the pandemic, um, what was really, really difficult was keeping up with everything that was going on because everything I was seeing was doom and gloom. And even as somebody who spends a lot of time uh, uh, and is like obsessed with politics, even I couldn't take watching CNN or MSNBC or the local news every day. And what that meant was that I was missing out on a lot of things that were happening in my community, a lot of things that were happening in the country. And I was disengaging, right, from um, trying to make change around those things that I cared about. So Lady Don't Take No is really a platform that we use um, to make politics accessible. We do that by talking about things that people care about in the pop culture realm, as well as the political realm. And we use pop culture to help explain politics. And what we've heard from our listenership is that it is the kind of um, uh, podcast that helps people want to take action. In our podcast, we tell stories about change makers, but not the stories you've heard from them all the time, not the stories that they tell you when they're on the news, but the behind the scenes of what makes change makers who they are so that that also becomes more accessible to more people. And I think lastly, I'll just say, cause I know we have to wrap up soon that the role of narrative change, right? Is to get people to take action differently um, and to also understand what's at stake for them, their communities, their loved ones and their families. And when we're talking about um, what it is we need to do as racial justice movements to build and advance a black led agenda for political power, the number one thing we have to do is tell new stories that are more complex, more nuanced and less fairy tale-ish than the ones that we tell about who our communities are right now. If we're able to accomplish that, more and more people will see themselves as somebody who can make change somebody who is needed to help make change, and more and more people will be able to connect what it is that they see and experience every day 
with the rules that are being made about us without us every single day. So let me pause there because I know I saw a thing that said five minutes, like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Have, uh, it's 302. We have until 305. Um, so you can continue or if you want to open it up for questions. Let's open it up. I talked a bunch. If you have questions, just unmute. Unmute, drop them in the chat. I can read out the chat. Don't be shy. Well, while you're thinking about what questions you might have, um, let me just pitch that. Uh, Alicia, oh. we have a question in the chat. I'm gonna jump in. What can we do? This is from uh, Kay Richardson. What can we do to get more stakeholders invested our, in our communities that need a narrative change? What can we do to get more stakeholders invested in our communities that need a narrative change? Mm. Um, I think the first thing to do here, the way I understand your question, is actually to do a little bit more listening. Um, one of the things I think happens a lot that we um, could consider differently um, is I don't think we pay enough attention to the stories that are already being told about us. We don't have enough rigor in understanding those stories and where they come from. And as a result, we end up repeating them. Let me give a quick example. When we talk about um, criminal justice reform, I've seen a hundred times a conversation that says, well, if black people would just stop killing black people, then violence would decrease in our communities. That's actually a right wing narrative that we have continued to um, repeat and populate, but we haven't done the work that we need to to actually listen to what's underneath that and to challenge it and to challenge it effectively. Not by saying you don't know what you're talking about, but by trying to get underneath the um, issues of safety and dignity and fear that have been preyed upon um, by other people in relationship to our communities and what it is that draws us um, to those narratives to repeat them, even though they're not ours. Um, so one thing I think is really important for us to do um, to get stakeholders more invested and involved is to show more examples of those stories and bring ideas for how those stories could shift. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Give me a sign. Okay, great. It's great to be here, everyone. Thank you. I'm just going to dive right in. Don't have to wait. Yeah, very excellent. Well, first, let me um, start by saying thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here and among this amazing group of people. Honored to be with Andrew and the leadership there. Um, it's wonderful to also listen. Um, I've been in and out of sessions for the last hour or so, and I'm so inspired. So thank you for having me. Again, my name is Ellen Buckman and I'm president of the Opportunity Agenda. I'm Zooming from my home outside of Washington, DC. Our headquarters, our one office is based in New York City and I split my time between my home and my office space. Um, I'm gonna be really, really brief and in a second I'm gonna share my screen. I have a really short presentation to offer to you all and I wanna get into discussion as quickly as I possibly can. Um, so really very fast, the Opportunity Agenda um, considers itself a social justice communication lab. Lab because we are always learning, we place a high value on learning and on making certain that we are experimenting to the best of our ability in finding the most effective narrative to shift toward change. Um, you can find us on opportunityagenda.org, that is our website. And I'm joined by my colleague Zay, who's gonna drop some things in the chat as I go through them. Thank you, Zay, in advance. To us, it's the Opportunity Agenda. Um, and if you were in Alicia's session, you heard a little bit about this. Thank you, Alicia, if you're here. Um, narrative um, shift is about political and cultural power. And for us, we work very hard to achieve that power through uplifting values. We see values as really the special sauce, if you will, to making narratives taste 
and smell and feel a little bit better or a little bit worse, depending on those values that you're looking at uplifting or that you're looking at redirecting. So values include things like community or voice or redemption, safety or justice or dignity, equity or inclusion. These are the things that we at the Opportunity Agenda work hard to understand. And as Alicia Garza just said, work hard to listen for in a conversation so that we're paying attention and making certain that those values are actually heard and that they're landing. I'm sure, and if I were in a room with you, I would ask you to raise your hand if you identify with when sometimes those values that you intend to land don't land the way that you intend or some other conversation, yeah, I see some heads nodding, is instead landing. And so that's why I'm here today to share with you a little bit about our methodology to make it a bit more easy. Um, nothing is easy, but more easy um, for y'all. And also to offer us up as a partner as you work to make sure that those narratives and those values that you're trying to achieve within them are actually landing in the way that you would like them to. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to attempt to share my screen and find what I'm trying to find. And sometimes I'm not so good at doing this. So let me do this. And I just did. I hope you're with me. Yeah, you with me? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go to my slideshow and start her up. Yay. So here we are. I've already introduced myself. Um, I want to say first and foremost that um, we see narrative, again, as that big story laden with values, values that either feel yucky or taste good. And often those big stories are in your head. We all walk around with many of them and sometimes they conflict. So I can both value ice cream because it's my favorite sweetness, but I can also hate it because it's added, yes, during the pandemic um, quite a bit. So resent it. So similarly, that puzzle of things that I'm walking around with, as you can see here by this image. And we all have lots of different narratives in our heads all the time, but we're not the ones we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about those who are trying to reach, right? Because they do too. So here's that puzzle. How does it fit together? And here are my tips for you today. So first and foremost, this is something that sessions have already covered today, but I think it's important enough um, for me to very quickly underscore. Narrative shift is not the same thing as messaging shift, right? Narrative shift is not the same thing as messaging shift. Kind of a not so great metaphor to use here, but I'm just going to use it anyway because I'm striving to come up with another one in my head. Um, messaging shifts involve those sort of point and shoot, very fast communications, messaging tactics that are really important in that short term effort that you're trying to do in that target audience that you're trying to get, whether it's for a legislative um, uh, goal or something else. And they add up to the big story, right? That people carry around over the long term, not the same thing. And we, we can't conflate the two really very, very important. And it's definitely a lesson that we learn and relearn over time. Secondly, as I said, values-based message is where it's at. And part of why they're sweet and part of why they're sour is because they tend to involve um, sheroes and theros as well as villains too. Mostly, um, actually, all narratives do that to some degree. And this is important to stress because sometimes they can sneak up on you. And sometimes when we're looking for that hero or that Shiro or that Vero, we think of them as a person, but often they're not necessarily a person, they're a structure um, that was built, as you know, very intentionally the way that it was built that we're trying to dismantle. Or sometimes it's a force in our country, a conversation that we want to change, like one, for example, that we're all still in, that we saw starting to break through during the pandemic around the importance of work, the importance of safety and the importance of defining it for everyone and not only those people, those sheroes, those heroes, those zeros in that story who were protecting us from uh, the coronavirus. And so really important to recognize this and really important um, to not only think about it, but think about who we would want to see and what structures we would want to see. And I was in Rinku's session a little bit before this one and she spent some time not talking about this concept, but instead talking about how to make sure the story that we want to tell lands because connecting those, those villains, heroes, zeros, um, 
to that story in real term is really important, really important, not just to tell the story that we want to see, but to connect it so that people actually get it. And we can talk about that if people have questions, you can put that in the chat. The next piece related to that is, y'all, um, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Um, it's really important that we think about those pieces and that we tell our own affirmative story and that at the opportunity agenda, we don't spend our airtime, our precious airtime, doing too much of what we call myth busting, right? Are you familiar with this term? Okay, some of you are saying yes. Myth busting is when we, re we repeat um, a dominant narrative that we don't agree with or something that our opponents are putting out there. And then we bust it. We say why it isn't true and what we would do instead. I'm guilty of doing this. I think we all are. It's often sometimes we go to something we go to when we're watching something play out before our very eyes. And it's really important that when we acknowledge it, we pivot away as quickly as we can. And we say what we see as those solutions and why those solutions that we offer work better. And that aspiration as something that we can achieve, right? Um, and I'll tell you why. Our research tells us, <clears throat> and we've researched this, that audiences won't remember our story if we use it as a follow-up to the other story that we're myth busting. Instead, they think about what the myth is and they wonder about it. And they don't think about what the solution is, which is what we're trying to lead them to. So just another lesson learned. And when we're sharing our values, really, really important to be grounded in this because it's really, really important to give people something to be for, which is another piece of research that I'll point to. Um, generally speaking, persuasive audiences, we do a lot of work around audience segmentation, tend to follow when there's something that they want to follow or before, as opposed to only the story that they're trying to see go away. You know, I can relate to that. Certainly reading the newspaper these days is story after story of things that I don't want to see. So it's often the case that I think about what the alternative would be. You get the point. So very quickly, moving on, um, I wanted to share a tool. At the Opportunity Agenda, one of our core competencies, in addition to the sort of tools that I'm pointing out, um, is, an, and if Zay, you can put this in the chat, that's be great, um, is using VPSA um, to uplift the values that we want to see out there so that we're not spending as much time on the problem. Um, and this is a formula that we came up with. And trust me, it works not only in the context of what we're trying to achieve from the narrative side, from our work side, it works in pretty much every conversation. It works when I'm talking to my wife and trying to convince her of something. It works when I'm talking to a personality on the media and so forth. And so coming up with what the value is that we want to stress Think about what is impeding that value or the problem that's getting in its way. Offering a solution very, very quickly uh, around what we think um, could work. Um, and then again, really important to stress, offering an action that we want audiences to take. And something that I wanna bring up here is that we don't wanna ever leave out the action. We don't want to be ambiguous about it, and we don't want to suggest to people that they can figure out what to do. Oftentimes we do that because we either run out of time or we haven't planned well enough, and I should say I, not we. Um, it's definitely the case that without providing that action, we're going to lose, I'm going to lose opportunities to bring audiences along, which is the whole point, again, of really injecting the values into the narrative and bringing people to the action that we want to take. And then finally, um, well, not finally, sorry, um, almost finally. Long-term collaboration and investment um, is something that I also want to stress, and it goes back to that first jigsaw puzzle piece about short-term messaging. I've been around long enough to think about this in times of pre and post, pre being when um, organizations and efforts that I was a part of really only focused on the short-term messaging needs for short-term campaigns to the detriment of the long-term collaborative work to achieve the long-term narrative and story, which takes longer than those short-term efforts. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that I participated in um, when President Obama announced his intention for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, executive order was help um, come up with, and some of you probably participated in this too, um, communications advice to work with them 
on. And one of the things that that community came up with um, was advice around how, through no fault of their own, these young people were here. And that unintentionally had the effect of throwing under the bus their parents and the people who brought them. And we didn't think about that long-term story in that moment at all, or very little. And so I bring that up to say that now, um, I think the story may be, have been a little bit different had we had a little bit more intentionality about how that short-term conversation related to that long-term story and thought more about that long-term collaborative work that we needed to do along with and this is something that Andrews I know knows, or they wouldn't have us all here, um, an investment um, in doing that and making sure that communicators have what they need to do that. Really important to think about. So finally, um, it, you know, it all comes down to culture. All of this adds up to it, right? Culture envelops everything that I'm about to say. I have no time left. And I'm going to end with that and ask you to please make sure to count us in as partners. This is my puzzle all together um, and to get in touch with us. Um, we have tips, we have tools, we have ways of putting all of this into action and we're here for you. Thank you so much. My God, that went by fast. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. Hi, Marisa, how are you on behalf of AFF? We're so excited to have you. I know we're doing um, these kind of like rapid style presentations. So we have until 3.35 together. I'll drop a reminder in the chat, but we've also been doing the broadcast. So feel free to jump in whenever you're ready. All right, hey everybody. Um, I am going to do my best to hit some uh, hopefully useful points in the next few minutes. I'm going to just do a quick um, sharing of just what Mijenta is. So I'm going to share my screen here. Y'all see this? All right. So um, Mijenta is five years old. Um, we are a, we talk about ourselves as a IRL and URL, which means organizing online and organizing in real life hub for Latinx and Chicanx people. Um, a lot of us that started Mijenta came out of most recently, um, anti-deportation organizing, but we really saw what, um, you know, sort of the juxtaposition of um, the growth of the Latinx population. Uh, Latinx people are the youngest demographic in the United States, uh, averaging about 27 years old. Um, and just like the growth of the community, um, you know, often talked about as part of the progressive majority or the new majority as it's called. Um, and then also on the other side, seeing, you know, a growing kind of uh, storm on the horizon, um, you know, rooted in racist reaction to demographic, social and cultural change in the United States. So we created Mijente to, to build more organizing infrastructure in the Latinx community. We did so really um, wanting to have a, a, you know, an earnest and meaningful conversation about some of the things that haven't, um, some of the ways in which inside of, we need to have conversations inside of our own community. Um, and, and we didn't want to just create like a, you know, a Latinx advancement or just kind of a, a more like, uh, you know, sort of single issue, single focus organization. So we often, you know, talked about it's like, it's for Latinx people who want to improve conditions in our community and people who are also pro-Black, pro-Indigenous, pro-worker, pro-LGBTQ, pro-immigrant, pro-Pachamama. Um, so that slide talks a little bit about the, the sort of the, the both the opportunity and the threat. Um, and we've done our work, you know, um, you know, as a combination of um, local and national organizing. Um, campaigns work campaigns for us is is you know the core vehicle where we can bring people together and prove that organizing works. Um, some of our campaigns have focused around things like um, the role of data and technology companies in criminalization in immigration enforcement. Um, we've also done electoral work um, and we have a membership that is both kind of hybrid where people can join as individuals. We also work with local organizations. Um, and I viewed as like the way we build power is fighting policy for and against policies, um, 
organizing outside of the system and really creating intentional space for that. Um, and then um, from within the system specifically around electoral work. Um, and so, you know, the, the question of story, the question of narrative is very, very important for our work. Um, you know, and as I was preparing, thinking about this piece, I'm gonna stop sharing here. That's the, the basics about mi gente. Um, you know, I, I often feel very confused to be real about what is narrative? Like it feels like fluffy sometimes. And it's this concept that's been made much more complicated than I think it has to be. And so what I just kept coming to is like, if we imagine like a snapshot of a particular thing, whatever that thing could be, it could be anything, but what's the, what's within the, the frame, right? Um, and oftentimes our community's perspectives, our community's experience um, as oppressed people, as marginalized people are not in the dominant frame or we are in the frame, but we are being uh, talked about as if we're part of the problem. Um, and so our work as organizers is to shift that story, is to shift that frame. And in our experience, there's been two central ways that we have done that, recognizing that we don't always have the mic, recognizing that there is a tremendous amount of um, built up narrative in terms of the, how the history is told of this country, um, what, what popular culture says about different people in our communities. And so one way is that we've done it through direct action. And I'm an old kind of somewhat closeted theater nerd. Um, and so we always talk about it as like, we need to storm the stage. And so that's both something that I mean figuratively and I also sometimes mean it literally. And so there's been moments where you have a particular moment, a particular thing happening. And how do we as affected people actually literally storm the stage and disrupt what's happening and in essentially for that moment, take the mic and tell our own story and make it difficult for the status quo business as usual story to be told. <clears throat> We've done this a tremendous amount inside of the immigrant rights movement. Um, there was literally one time we did a action where we called it uh, be our own advocate. And we took a crew of folks who were undocumented and actually went to um, organizations that are usually the ones that are the the ones that are consulted about what immigrant policy should be and very few people in the room are actually immigrant and actually went and had um, like, would you give up your seat at the table so that someone who's actually in fact impacted by this could be part of it. Um, there's been, you know, um, you know, moments where there's court cases that are being, you know, deliberated and then outside we, we, we close down the street and there's people sitting in the street in civil disobedience. Um, and guess what? That means that probably someone's supporter is going to come up to them and say, why are you doing this? And then they get to say that. Then the next day when they're like, so-and-so, so-and-so was, you know, arguing the merits of blah, blah, blah case. Also, there was these people outside and they were doing X. So that's a storming the stage example. The other one I think is the way I try to kind of think about it is that you, you name kind of the alternative and you organize around that. Um, that one's probably less the direct action persuasion and it's more kind of an ongoing piece. Um, I think that we can look at a bunch of different things in our, um, in our, in our political moment um, that, that you know, um, can speak to this from the way in which um, climate change has transformed over how it's been talked about in, in the years, both in terms of like um, the, the urgency and what it's going to take to solve it to also communities placement in that. Um, we can easily look at the role and in, in, in sort of the example of indigenous communities that have really, um, you know, created an alternative. And there's like a piece there that there's just like constantly driving that narrative. And, and as a result over time, bringing people to their view of what things need to look like. Um, I think the, you know, when we look at the origin stories and kind of the the the, the conversation when um, Black Lives Matter and movement for Black Lives was born. Um, I think that that conversation it sparked in terms of what does it mean for not only Black people to feel safe and really basic um, needs and wants in this country, but what does it mean to build political space, political imagination 
and an actual movement that asserts not only um, the right for Black survival, but for Black people to thrive and, and, and to be more than just survive, to actually be able to be good. Um, so, you know, I think those are kind of like the very like big picture things, but again, kind of going back to what I originally um, talked about here is I almost kind of did this as like, what's the hood way of trying to affect narrative? Because there is such an industry now around this. And I don't know if your organization has a million dollar budget to do communications or a $50,000 budget or a $25 budget. <laughs> and the problem is sometimes everybody assumes that in order to do it well, you need the million dollar budget. And I'm here to tell you that's bullshit. Um, and it can't be true and it's just not true um, because it's actually not sustainable and not real. Um, and so there's a couple of things that I would say for if like your organization in particular doesn't have a robust um, you know, that you can segment and be like, well, this person does data and this person does social media on Wednesdays and this person does this. It's like, not everybody got it like that. And sometimes I would even argue that that's not even, that doesn't get you more anyway, but that's for another day, another conversation and perhaps polemical. Um, but if you are trying to figure this out, I think just the value of authenticity in this time is, is pretty much without value. Um, and so if your organization is an organization that's close to the ground, that has real relationships with people, um, the messengers that you have at your disposal and the stories they have are people probably pay people a lot of money to go find people like that. And so it's just a question, if you have that, then how are you deploying and bringing people into the frame at the right time with the message that's meant to really kind of shake things up? And so the messenger really matters. I know the person speaking in the other breakout room, I think is speaking to like opportunities inside of Hollywood. That's also a really important um, place that's different than what I'm talking about because the pe people in all facets of society are witnessing the times we're in and people are trying to figure out what the hell do I do? And so folks inside of Hollywood, I think have, um, and, and in other parts of civil society have really important roles to play, particularly as validators, but the messenger matters, the message matters. So gentle nudge here for us that love to just kind of like blast it out is just like, well, if your frame is right here, you have to have a sense of where the frame is. If you're over here, then no one's really gonna hear the story if you're that far out. You've got to figure out, okay, what, what's gonna be close enough that we can actually insert ourselves here? And that's paying attention to what is the current discourse for better, for the good, bad, and ugly. Um, distribution, I would flag as something that is a huge topic. Um, we have a distribution problem in the progressive movement. Um, the, the right wing has seized this. And so sometimes our message is better, but they have a robust, powerful, distribution system that gets to millions of people every day and is shaping people's frame. Um, and, and just having really clear goals. Um, if you're trying to get into the press, then be really like specific about what are the journalists, who's, who's on that beat, like just getting really, really specific um, is, is, and not trying to do everything and be everything for everybody um, is things I would say that are really important to be able to storm the stage articulate an alternative narrative and organize people around it. Um, I think organizations of all size, all sizes, all persuasions have the power to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. And if anyone has any questions, you can drop them in the chat. We'll be doing some follow-up uh, post this convening. Super appreciate you. Super appreciate the accessible framing of storming the stage. Um, and being in the frame and getting into the frame, I think that's um, a point of accessibility that a lot of folks can relate to and also want to live, right? Like everyone, you know, you mentioned organizations of various size and budgets that can do it the, you know, the whole way or how, however you want to put it, right? Like because the messenger matters um, in addition to the message. So just want to. Um, what's one thing that you would want to see your org do and what would you need to do it?
Is, is that a question for me? Yeah, um, well, for... <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for somebody. I thought somebody else might be on. Um, I, well, we, the, uh, I'm coordinator youth program and a lot of the things they were talking about in terms of um, youth empowerment and, um, let me see, I took me some notes. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, no kids in prison and the pop culture. Those are some of the things in using. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm relatively new to the organization, but I thought the TikTok um, thing was a, a big thing that we might could incorporate in our organization. Uh, we talked about racial justice. So I actually saw a number of things that we deal with already that could possibly be enhanced uh, by some of the things that um, that's being presented today. That's that's wonderful. And um, the TikTok presentation was really great. It was amazing the way she broke it down so quickly. Um, is uh, for our mm -hmm. other participants mm -hmm. uh, that have joined, is there anything that you would like to, that you learned today that you'd like to integrate into your organization and what would you need to do it? That's the question that we're grappling with right now. Um, and Pearl jumped in uh, saying there's a lot that she wants to do right now, holding up TikTok as a specific example. I'll jump in. My name is Roberta Rael and I'm um, in, um, I'm the founding director of Generation Justice and actually CERDNA Foundation was one of our very first funders many, many years ago. Um, and we are on uh, Tiwa land in what's now called New Mexico. Um, and I, I'm really grateful for today. We're not a grantee, but I'm so grateful for today because I think the networking around narrative shift is really critical. Um, it's been a wonky kind of thing. We have been doing narrative shift work for the 16 years of the life of this project in subtle and then very direct ways. And we um, are teaching about narrative shift in the area that we are in. Um, but I, I think that sometimes the isolation around um, narrative shift, how to do it, the various tactics and strategies of being able to do it, um, in isolation are really hard. So I love that there were so many experts, um, friends today presenting, uh, folks I, I look up to and admire that just help re-inspire our narrative shift work. Um, for me, inspire me as I'm carrying this out. We're doing a larger statewide narrative shift uh, partnership um, that our organization is the convener and leader. So there's so many things that I can take from what I heard today in helping it not be wonky, but also knowing that we are part of a, a, larger, a larger universe um, that we're moving in the same direction. Yeah, and those connections are so important, aren't they? Um, and I know that Manuela and Nayoka and the whole team want to share a bunch of resources afterwards. Are you all getting together, like getting together to network on a regular basis around narratives? Um, it, is, would it be helpful to have a list coming out of this of folks to contact? What else would be helpful to you around your narrative networking? And Elizabeth, is that a general question for everyone? Uh, it's a general question to everyone. Um, and uh, you feel free to jump into it as well. Definitely a list and then resources. Again, I was like, I'm not a grantee, but I really want to do this. So right. I kind of like, um, you know, came in um, after I saw the invitation from FCYO. So definitely helping us get more into a fold uh, would be helpful for us and probably other folks who aren't direct grantees. Yep. Of uh, the others on our Zoom, um, anyone else want to weigh in on the first question? 
Thank you very much to Pearl and Roberta for jumping in. We'll just give it a minute. I could go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. Ellie with Californians for Justice here. Um, I'm really excited to be th start thinking about cultural organizing or how we engage uh, our young, young people across the state and, yeah, um, cultural organizing and, um, and really helping tell the stories in different modalities, right? Like the stories we want to share about public education, about young people of color, right? Um, so my mind is kind of buzzing right now around like, oh, how, how do I, um, as someone in the comms team, how do I kind of integrate into the youth organizing programming work, right? Uh, and also like bring in this cultural strategy to what they're already doing um, in a way that doesn't feel like an extra thing <laughs> that they have to do, but it could be fun and exciting uh, for our bases. Yeah, totally. And uh, that was one of the, you know, the cultural strategy and the themes that came across um, with that is, it's like, this is the work. This is movement organizing and it doesn't have to be separate on the calm side of things too. So ways to pull that into the organization and make that more natural. That's what I'm hearing shine through Ellie. Um, and, you know, is anybody else on the call working on cultural organizing right now? Um, any tips for Ellie? Uh, and the rest of us on how to um, integrate that better into the daily work. And if not, that's okay too. Um, we can pivot on to the second question because we have about 12 minutes remaining is uh, so as the field is moving um, in the same direction, what does it need collectively to shape narratives? Is there a strategy, staff, story, and or vision? What would you need? Is it access to a press database? Um, is it access to more training like Reframe does? Is it just having a list of folks that you can call and collaborate with? Um, what would help you get those stories out there and help prepare your messengers for that as well? And I'm addressing this question to everybody, hoping that uh, somebody will feel, um, you know, speak up. And we'll give it a minute. And you can feel free to type things in the chat as well. I mean, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot, and I know the narrative initiative has been thinking about is, you know, activists and organizers are so busy. Um, how do you help people get their messages out? Is it by, you know, pairing people with writers for opinion pieces? Is it through training? Um, is it, uh, you know, what, what other tools are out there? And I see that um, Roberta has come on screen. So I'll turn it over to you. Oh, um, I don't have a lot of thoughts, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I do think that like from an organizer's perspective, and for the perspective also of working with young people and always wanting to build skills um, collectively, 
I was just thinking if there was a way to have some of the expertise, um, like, you know, folks like Rinku who are looking at it super big picture, folks like uh, Reframe that actually have trainings available, but somehow making uh, it possible for really small organizations like us to have more access to some of that in a way that's affordable for us to have access to that. And then training the young people in um, the tactics and strategies of narrative shift for the campaigns that we're all working on. And then the other piece of like organizing nationally is then connecting us somehow or helping us connect. So like um, if Ellie and their work is similar to the work that we're doing in um, New Mexico, that we are supporting each other even for a broader um, narrative shift at a national level. So it, again, breaking the isolation. Absolutely. Um, so some really clear takeaways from that, Roberta. Mm -hmm. um, I get to share two, I think two things that come to mind is one, like, <laughs> like trying things like how can we just try little pieces of narrative work and uh, get feedback on that right like someone who's an expert in that um and that led me to also think to think about like mentors in narrative work right because uh i think of internally like Sa'an is like a, a key narrative person and we're trying to train up other staff to be really good with narrative to be able to do it as well and I just think about how important it is that not just one person hold it right and build up that skill yes yeah yes. and for the long term right that we all learn and become experts in this yep absolutely so building the skills narrative mentors getting it throughout the organization and beyond. Um, would anybody else like to hop in? Was there anything that surprised you at today's session? No. Um, yeah, I was going to say, uh, I wasn't necessarily surprised, but uh, there were a lot of things that I was informed about um, that I had not been, that had not been brought to my consciousness. Uh, uh, understanding the makeup of America in the United States, and I, I know that there are things that exist uh, as a um, Black person from Mississippi. Uh, I'm just uh, listening. I'm listening to other people from other parts of the country who are pretty much experiencing a lot of the things that uh, Mississippi people experience, and so uh, and uh, different ethnic people. So uh, I heard the young lady, the Indian, the Native American, and uh, I listened to her when she was talking, and she was talking about we need to come together as an entire group of people and not just fight for our own thing. But it's, it, it appears that each uh, ethnic group tend to fight for what their needs are. And it's hard to bring up. We have been so separated that it's so difficult to bring us together, you know, uh, to fight some of the systemic type things that are going on. So each one, each, each, uh, and I'm careful with my words, each one of us are trying, each one of us is trying to uh, find a way for our own, for our own communities. And we tend not to embrace other communities. And, and I think that's a big problem. But one of the reasons I think is that there has been so much negativism that's been placed on the individual um, communities that they tend not to trust, even though we think that we're trusting and we think we have the same problem, but everybody uh, tend to think uh, that they are different, they're better. Uh, they hear things, say for example, they hear things from the African-American community 
and then that's how they think all of us are. Even though when they hear it about themselves, they know it's not true, and uh, but they can't understand or accept that it's not true for the other communities either. So uh, just listening uh, to what she was saying and things she was experiences, experiencing only brought my knowledge of that we're not the only, you know, as African Americans, we're not the only uh, group of people that are experiencing this type of thing. A hundred percent. And that's where the, um, you know, I, I think these uh, coming together can be so powerful. And it also reinforces that a lot of the dominant narratives, there's a multicultural aspect to it that we can come together and fight back against. I really appreciated um, uh, I think Rinku brought it up, I think Ellen brought it up a couple of times about also making sure you're not repeating the problems and the, 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 the dominant narratives to the myth busters, as it were. Um, and for me, that was something that, again, as uh, Pearl said, wasn't surprising, but just was it. the end. And I have a few notes uh, from the organizers before we jump in uh, to closing the day. Um, I just wanted to see if there are any other comments, questions, or, you know, points that anyone in the group wants to highlight. I'll go again, um, Elizabeth. Um, I loved, and I'm trying to think whose presentation it was, um, I loved that focusing on values yes. and it's how we approach our work and how we approach our work with training the young people to always be value centered. But I really loved hearing that today. It, um, it was just really important to hear like that, how we're doing this work. We're on track with that. Um, because in some ways, maybe I didn't think about it as narrative shift as much as it's like the heart of our work. So yeah. I loved that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and someone, I think uh, gonna, go ahead, Pearl. I was going to say, someone can uh, possibly enlighten me uh, with a different organ. I've only been with Southern Echo for less than a year. And uh, I'm meeting all kinds of organization or I'm becoming involved or connected with all kinds of organization. And my question is, uh, have these organizations been in existence and fighting for the changes that I have been hearing about? Because it seems as if there are a lot of them. And then when I think about that, I said the more um, the more changes that can be brought about as a result. But I don't know if we've been fighting the same thing for a long time or not, or is this something relatively new? Because I um, came from um, a different background and I'm not fam I was not familiar with this many organizations. Yeah. Um, uh, so quick answer, these organizations, many of them have been around forever and not forever, but a long time. Um, I think the narrative initiative is relatively new, but Rinku Sen has been around for a long time. And it just underscores, I think, something that uh, Reframe brought up is that it takes a long time to shift narratives. We're still shifting narratives from the civil rights moment. And so it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's a long haul and it happens in shifts, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so with uh, that, I think we're coming to our close. I want to thank everyone for joining us for terrific, uh, session on narrative. Um, as you know, the convening was recorded and it'll be shared with everybody and available on the AFF website. If you're a movement partner or want to be in dialogue about what you learned, feel free to reach out. Uh, AFF will follow up with suggested next steps. 
Um, the goal is to share what we learned and also develop a shared call for action for philanthropy and beyond. We ask all of you take a few minutes to fill out the post-event evaluation form. Amel, can you plop that into the chat so everybody has access to it? Um, and we just really thank you uh, for being in community with us for terrific uh, conversation and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation in the weeks, to, weeks, days, months, years to come.